a, a shout out to our expert AV folks who are keeping everything, everything running. Sorry, we're a few minutes behind here. Uh, uh, for the cameras, again, my name is uh, Will Inboden, Executive Director of the Clement Center, one of your hosts for today. And uh, honored to be introducing this very special uh, panel discussion here we have with um, three distinguished uh, statesmen, uh, three alumni of the Reagan administration. So rather than the formal academic papers that we're having on most of the other panels, this one will be more uh, informal recollections and reminiscences about um, what it was like working in the administration uh, for the president himself, uh, uh, the atmos atmosphere of the time. And uh, each of our panelists will uh, offer uh, you know, 10 to 15 minutes of uh, prefatory comments, and then we'll turn it over for Q&A, uh, especially for the historians, my fellow historians in the room, which is most of you, this is your time to uh, do the expert interview you've been, uh, you've been wanting, wanting to do. Um, so introducing our three panelists, uh, first over on this end, um, the man who needs no introduction. Uh, I mean that literally because I introduced him three hours ago. So anyway, uh, again, Ambassador Ken, Ken Edelman. Uh, I, I don't mind. Go on. Okay. All right. So anyway, so that's right. Uh, I'll give you 45 minutes. Man. Okay. Yeah. Um, for our purposes here, though, was um, uh, served as one of uh, President Reagan's ambassadors to the UN and then head of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, uh, then uh, was also a troubleshooter in a number of other ways. I was uh, want to talk to you about your role in helping Carlucci uh, put together some of the pieces of the NSC after um, for Ron Contra. So uh, then in the, in the middle here, uh, again, a man to those of us here in Austin and many other Americans who needs no introduction, Admiral Bob Inman, uh, holds the Centennial Chair, a distinguished uh, professor here at the university, it's at the LBJ School. Uh, for our purposes, also a very important alum of the Reagan administration. Um, uh, he was the NSA director at the beginning of the administration and was uh, referenced um, uh, by one of the, one of the speakers in the, in the earlier panel, and then was the deputy director of central intelligence for the first few years of the administration. Uh, and Admiral, I didn't even know if I've told you this before, but when I was doing some work in the Reagan archives a couple of years ago, I came across a fascinating letter from Senator Barry Goldwater to then President-elect uh, Ronald Reagan, as written in late November of 1980, urging President-elect Reagan to appoint Admiral Inman as the director of the CIA. Mm -hmm. um, uh, anyway, the counterfactuals are very interesting to think about what might have played out. I'll, I'll just leave it at that to anyone who knows uh, IC history there. And then uh, closest to me is Professor Henry Now, a very distinguished scholar, political scientist at George Washington University, but for our purposes, a Reagan administration alum from the National Security Council staff where he was the senior director for international economic affairs uh, the first uh, first couple years. And the final thing to emphasize before I turn it over to our, our, our panelists is um, We've got a tremendous breadth of expertise represented on the panel. We've got you know Henry, who worked at the White House, uh, uh, and then Admiral Inman and uh, Ambassador Edelman, who were at uh, you know departments and agencies. Uh, they, they also span the first and, and second term. So we've really got a, a pretty uh, capacious breadth of experience from the administration and some varied perspectives there. So uh, we'll start with Ambassador Edelman first. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be as Henry VIII was with his various wives, I will be brief. Um, <laughs> just because, you know, I had my time, and so I'll mostly react uh, to things that were said. But uh, let me say, react first to the panel that before, there was a wonderful, wonderful panel. So uh, kudos for everybody in it and for Will for putting it together here at the Clemens Center. Uh, the whole question of agency and how much a president actually does is an age-old question. I uh, and our Colorado home have on the wall all the Time Magazine Persons of the Year since 1927 uh, because I believe that people really do make history and really do change things. And this Toynbee and uh, Tolstoy idea of the flow of the times I think is a good excuse for those getting in and flowing to tell you the truth, who really don't want to change much. There's a big difference between transactional presidents and transformational presidents. And a transactional president is basically an inbox president. A uh, transformational president is an outbox president, one who really wants to make a change. In my area, as I said in the talk, uh, the fact is there were four pillars of Ronald Reagan's strategy. Whether he thought this was a strategy or not, I have no idea. Whether he really put the four together, I have no idea. But they were very distinct. Number one was the uh, delegitimization of the Soviet leadership. It started the first press conference he had as president. And there's no mistake about it. They lied, cheat, steal to uh, further their aims. And ended with his speech 
to the nation right when he left office. And the suspicion about uh, the Soviet leadership and the system was prevalent. No other president had done anything like that. Nixon, uh, Carter, no one had delegitimized the Soviet Union like that. It just wasn't done. So that's new, brand new. Second was, like I say, the overall defense buildup. That, I concede, was more of a Republican view than anything at that time. So I would say out of the four, that's the closest that somebody else would have done. But a Republican president, a vast buildup when he got into office. Uh, number three is, of course, SDI. And SDI would not have happened with Ronald Reagan. Uh, people ask all the time, well, at Reykjavik were people trying to talk Reagan into accepting Gorbachev's cashiering of SDI. And I said, to tell you the truth, the issue never came up. Why? Because Reagan knew what he wanted. He did not want the uh, SDI to be cashiered in any respect. So that, that was pretty well set with him. So the, these kind of factors were, you know, from Reagan and from his, uh, his thoughts. The fourth was, of course, the real reduction in nuclear weapons, not the limitations of increases. All right, again, nothing that Carter ever thought of or wanted or advocated, nothing that Nixon ever thought of or wanted or advocated, nothing that Ford ever wanted or advocated, nothing that we in the business really thought was doable, but was startling and Reagan insisted on it. Okay, those, out of those four things, at least three and a half of them are unique to Ronald Reagan and no one else would have done that. Uh, second overall point I would make is on the very good panel uh, before us, uh, which I learned a lot from, the question of the human rights. Uh, Sarah, a very nice job on that. Uh, but I would make three overall points, okay? Number one, the, the rap that Ronald Reagan, in retrospect, gets for <clears throat> really going after human rights against communism, not against authoritarian South African, South American bad guys around the world, uh, I think is totally justified. Authoritarian dictators never massacred tens of millions of people as communism did. Authoritarian governments can change. South Korea goes from authoritarian government to a free government. Taiwan goes from authoritarian government to a free government. Chile goes from authoritarian government to a freer government. Okay? Communists, till the end of the Cold War, never changed. So I think the idea Let's really stress human rights against communism rather than against authoritarianism. I think it's totally justified, okay? Second overall point on human rights is, Sarah, I'm sure it's in your paper, but this is a gigantic factor. The gigantic factor is, of course, Iran. The Shah was a bad guy. Khomeini is much worse. Ronald Reagan comes in. The day tomorrow that he sworn in 30 years ago was the day that the hostages were released from Iran, okay? After 444 days. There was a trauma in the United States about Iran. There was a clear evidence that if you go, like Carter did, to remove, all too late, the Shah, you're going to get maybe something a lot worse. And you know what, in Iran, we got something a lot worse. People there said, oh, it couldn't be worse than the Shah. By the way, it was. All right? I was very fortunate at the inauguration. I went to the inauguration. I was having a black tie party at my own house. The night of the inauguration, I had my parents in town, a few brothers and their wives in town. I had Gene Kirkpatrick, George Will, uh, the Rumsfelds, the Cheneys, all kinds of people we were friendly with that time. And it was so cool because that night, I left my own black tie party, went over to Wiesbaden with Jimmy Carter to uh, welcome the ex-hostages that just had been released. So uh, I followed the story very carefully. But the idea of uh, 
the experience of an Iran was a gigantic overhang for the human rights situation uh, during the Reagan administration. Third point I would make is you have the grade on the curve on human rights. Okay? Carter spoke about the human rights policy. I don't know if it was any different than the Reagan policy. He toasted the Shah of Iran as the uh, island of stability in a turbulent area. I don't, I don't think that was a great human rights. I don't remember Carter taking a stance on South Africa or South America or other places that was quite that was radically different from the Reagan administration. He gave a few more speeches than, uh, than Reagan did on human rights, but I don't see any policy big differences, nor do I see big differences I don't want to wrap on, uh, give a wrap on Carter. I don't see any differences in other presidents. Obama talked about human rights. He hung on to Mubarak a very long time when everybody <laughs> generally thought, you know, Mubarak was on his way out on that. Um, he had, um, you know, acceptances, uh, certainly the most horrendous human rights violation probably since World War II, to tell you the truth, is Syria, of which um, Obama did nothing. Okay? I can't imagine a human rights situation where you have over a half a million people in a situation and uh, American president basically giving, mentioning it a few times, it's statistic, it's a terrible thing, but um, you know, not actually not doing anything. I think that's the most horrendous human rights record I have seen since World War II. All right, those are my views on the past. Real quickly, Will, I would have to say that uh, working for Ronald Reagan was a delight. Uh, I was very lucky because he was interested in certain things and he was not interested in a lot of things, okay? <laughs> and those things he was not interested, he wasn't interested, all right? And it was kind of a uh, odd situation that um, he cared about. I was lucky, he cared about my field and he cared enormously about my field. Uh, in the year I was sworn in as Arms Control Director, moving in from the United Nations, uh, 1983, a very eventful year, uh, <coughs> of which there were no talks ongoing, uh, I went over to the White House, I think something like uh, 38 times with meetings for the president, almost once a week. All right? I can imagine what it would be like if we had ongoing talks during that time. But there was always something coming up. And the reason for these uh, meetings was that Ronald Reagan was interested in the subject. He liked to talk about it. When you look at the thousand or so radio broadcasts he did before becoming president, in those years after he was governor and before president, uh, you think of the hot button issues that people use to get elected, especially get the nomination in the Republican Party, and they were God, guns, and gays, all right? The three Gs. Uh, Ronald Reagan spoke of practically in none of them in the thousand. Uh, radio broadcast. He mentioned, I think abortion was one out of the 1,000. Uh, gun control may have been one. I don't know. Uh, and uh, gays was none. Uh, and, you know, those, weren't, those are the hot button issues to the electorate, and school prayer and all those things, but they weren't to Ronald Reagan. Over some half of his talks were about Soviet affairs or arms control. Okay? And he had to choose them and did choose it. So it was, I was lucky. He was interested in this field. Uh, he knew what he knew and he knew what he didn't know. And uh, it was very typical at Reykjavik, as I said in my remarks, that he asked for the experts to get together that night. He gave us the overall view, reduced by half, try to get the Soviets to go along on how that would be done try to eliminate the Euro missiles, and um, he was happy with whatever solution we came up with on doing that, as long as it was just the overall thought and the overall guidance he had. And on SDI, which was really the hot button issue in Reykjavik, he didn't ask us our opinion, he didn't need our opinion, he had his own opinion. And he really led the way on SDI, <coughs> which was his program rather than our program. Thank you all.
Admiral? Kendall, <clears throat> one note I would add mm -hmm. back. Jay Ford doesn't get the credit he deserves on the issue of human rights because it, he included that in the Helsinki Accords. Yeah, that was good. And when we talk later to the refuseniks who survived mm -hmm. the time, they said that's what gave them hope that there was external support and would eventually lead to the communists losing power and control. Fair point. Very good point. Um, mine are reminiscences <laughs> of a very warm individual who was very approachable, uh, who was very likable, uh, very easy to work with. Uh, I first encountered him at a place called the Bohemian Grove out <laughs> on the Russian River, where I was the guest of George H.W. Bush, who was making a lakeside appearance. This is pretty critical if you're aiming toward hoping to run for the presidency. <laughs> uh, both Bush and Reagan were longtime members of the Bohemian Grove. Uh, there was a luncheon after the lakeside speech at Bush's camp, and there were three of us retired Navy four stars there as his guest. When Governor Reagan spotted us, he got the platform, the mic, and told the story about the Barbary pirates and <laughs> standing up to fight them. And when he finished, uh, future President Bush turned to him and said, damn, he is good <laughs> in the process of what you were going to see. Fast forward, next encounter with the governor was uh, after he'd in fact uh, taken the oath of office, the day after he'd taken the oath of office. I had been approached in uh, late November, what I consider being the deputy director of central intelligence, and it was very easy. I just said, hell no, uh, <laughs> in the process. I was getting ready to retire. I had done uh, seven plus years at that point. I was blocking promotion opportunities for people I'd helped bring along in the naval intelligence side. That was from Ed Rowney, who was doing intelligence. Went out to Australia for a visit, got pulled out of Minister of Defense office by Bill Mittendorf. Mm. Uh, Bobby, I understand you turned it down, you gotta take this job. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to. And then got back from that trip and my first encounter meeting Cap Weinberger, who offered me, wasn't to persuade me to go to the, DDCI offered me a job at the Pentagon in the process. Momentarily thought that sounded pretty exciting until my wife said, are you crazy? <laughs> so I turned it down and thought things were behind. I was so immersed with President Carter on the final negotiations for getting the hostages mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. And in fact, my last conversation with Carter as president and uh, the president-elect is sitting next to him there in the limo headed to the Capitol to tell him that the hostages were in the aircraft but would not be permitted to take off till Carter was no longer president. Next morning, secretary comes running in saying, president's calling. I thought it was Carter following up. It was the president. Couldn't have been more charming. And he went through the whole rationale. When they lost New Hampshire, he invited Bill Casey mm -hmm. to chair his political campaign. Right. And then asked in his typical manner, and a bill if we're successful, what job would you like in the administration? And Casey responded, well, if I can't be Secretary of State, Director of Central Intelligence. He'd, made his, he'd been ahead of OSS operations in Europe, World War II, great event in his life. Um, they laughed. Go forward to Tuesday night, November, and it's clear he's won. Turns to Casey and said, well, Bill, are you ready to be Director of Central Intelligence? He said, if I can't be Secretary of State <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the process. Casey was always wanting to keep dribbling. <laughs> and about an hour later, phone rang. This is another president's told me all of this. It was Barry Goldwater congratulating him on winning the election, and said, I only have one request. I have the perfect candidate to be the Director of Central Intelligence. 
Vice Admiral Bobby Enlin, who's running NSA. And he said, well, I said, I've, I met Admiral Enlin, but I've already, Barry, I've already given the job to Bill Casey. Long silence, because Casey and Goldwater hated one another <laughs> from Republican Party politics. Um, then they, they're sort of starting out how to deal with this, and the president said, I got more calls generated by Barry about you than anybody else <laughs> running. He just wouldn't get off of it. So <laughs> Dick Helms suggested, well, why don't you do a shotgun marriage? Uh, have Inman as the deputy. And said, and we did that, and well, then you declined. And I know Cap had a conversation with you, and you declined. Well, now we're in office, and speaking as your commander in chief, I need you and I want you to take the job as Bill Casey's deputy. Under the circumstances, Mr. President, I'd be honored, hopefully no more than 18 months, two years. He agreed to that and then said, by the way, thank you for doing it. I'm going to nominate you for a fourth star. So that's how this ersatz career ended up with uh, four stars. It was a very strange, I was confirmed on the 13th of February took up the job. I was still the director of the National Security Agency until the 30th of March. And one of my favorite things, we solved more problems between those two agencies <laughs> in that six weeks. I learned from Rick over about sending letters back and forth from Navy and DOE of how to do it. But Casey wanted to run totally different from any past director. Normally, the director deals with the outside world the deputy runs the agency. That wasn't what he wanted. He wanted to personally run the clandestine service, covert operations, and the analytical side. He didn't want anything to do with science, technology, administration, or all that community stuff, budgets, and all the rest. <laughs> I had been in the job six days, and I got a call. The president wanted to see me. So I get in the car and go down. And there's Frank Carlucci. He'd also been summoned. And it was very simple and direct. Um, and the first time he ever called me by my first name. Uh, Bobby, um, Bill has told me that you're going to do everything with regard to budgets and the rest. Rebuild the intelligence community and spend whatever you need to spend. And Frank, you decide where to put it in the defense budget <laughs> to make it happen. <laughs> You could not have had clearer or simpler guidance on what to do. So we laid out a five-year plan and got started and found that the drawdowns had limited the training establishment, so many other things. There were real limits in how much you could rebuild at mm -hmm. what pace. Because he had asked for uh, cabinet status, Bill had been granted that, which meant I was sub-cabinet level. Casey never went to a cabinet meeting or an NSC meeting in my 18 months. I went to all of them. The only thing he went to was the National Security Planning Group where approval of covert operations were done in the process. Um, and it was fascinating to sit at the angle and watch the president. He was amazingly relaxed and but when people were uh, you know, talking sort of endlessly. What I picked up about the second or third session was the role Ed Meese played. You'd be 10 minutes to go in the session, however much time had been allocated, and Meese would interrupt wherever it was and ask questions. The president would pick up his pencil. Meese would cut off the long-winded answer, ask two or three more questions. The president would then summarize the meeting and what he summarized were the answer to Mises' questions. Mm -hmm. So he hadn't bothered with all that other He knew he was going to get the essence of what was important from Ed, and then he would, in fact, pick that up. Um, the, and there were so many encounters. His, he loved to tell jokes. He didn't need joke writers. It was just natural. Uh, early on, uh, there were still separate men's and women's press corps, and so the bank, uh, banquet of the women's White House press corps. And they had six new members of Congress, 
all trying to be funny. <laughs> Called him Schneider from Rhode Island wearing a Groucho Marx uh, things. D'Amato, new senator from New York, said, well, the president knew how he was going to solve the budget deficit. He was going to show his old movies at the White House and <laughs> charge people to attend them. They all finished. The president goes up, turns and looks at D'Amato and said, Dom, if my movies had made that kind of money, I wouldn't be here <laughs> in the process. But it was, that was just his nature and his ease uh, and speed at dealing with them. Um, he, didn't, he wasn't interested in the details unless they were pertinent to something that was on his mind. And then he would pursue them and get them, grasp them, and hold on to them. We were meeting about a year in, and he made the comment that nothing useful to the US had ever come from the arms control agreements. So, Mr. President, I would like to suggest maybe sometimes there were. Well, what? So I talked about how they had made the decision, given the limits, to do fewer SSBNs and more mobile missiles, as you came to deal with all later. And he said, nobody's ever told me that. And he picked it up and used it. Uh, so it was classic that when he saw something, he would change his mind if he accepted its vulnerability and then move with it. Um, the shift in his dealing with the Soviet Union owes a substantial debt to Margaret Thatcher. Gorbachev had come to power, thank you know, the Brezhnev to Andropov to Chernyenko years were finally behind us. And Miss Thatcher was the first one to meet Gorbachev. And she called him, called the president, and said, Ronnie, this is somebody we can work with. And that began a process. Now, by this point, I'm already out, but my departing week, Mrs. Thatcher had called, uh, Falkland War was underway, and they had concluded they urgently needed to be able to stage through Ascension Island to be able to support mm -hmm. the forward deployment. Uh, Ascension was an island that had been leased to us. In fact, it was a NSA asset uh, for collection purposes. And uh, so we're being told this, and Ambassador Kirkpatrick at the UN said, oh, Mr. President, you can't approve that. It would destroy hemisphere solidarity. And uh, again, one of those unfortunate outbursts, uh, what hemispheric solidarity? It's fiction, it's never occurred. The British have been with us since the War of 1812, every time we've been in a crisis. <laughs> and he turned and said, sorry, Jean, uh, tell Maggie she can use Ascension Island. And it was that kind of cutting through the fog for simplicity that I saw. One final note, um, it was clear from the beginning he focused on people and what motivated people and what the influences were on people. And knowing he was going to head for dialogue with the Soviets, I introduced a character into the mix called Suzanne Massey. Suzanne Massey, former wife of a naval officer, uh, had written a book called The Land of the Firebird. It's a magnificent book on Russian art and history. And uh, the Soviets were, they loved the display of the art and hated that they didn't get any credit for it. So I recommended, uh, through Deaver, that they bring her in to brief the president. He was taken with it. He had her back several times before going. And she was, uh, she was the one who was insistent that the intelligence committee was totally wrong on religion. The idea that, you know, communism has wiped it out. She said it's still alive. It's just submerged in the process. Fast forward years to George W. Bush's first encounter with Putin. And he'd been briefed that, in fact, Putin wore a cross that his mother had given him. 
And as he relayed to us here, he went, after they'd done their formal conversation, went down just the two and the interpreters, Bush asked him. And Putin opened his shirt and showed him the cross. And that was the background behind saying, I've looked in his eyes and I've seen his soul. And we had a year where things worked well and they didn't. So I'm rambling too long. <laughs> but what I want to convey was the warmth of the individual, how sharp the mind was, and by and large, how little interest he had in details, broad policies. What else? The contrast with President Carter could not have been more extreme. President Carter wanted every detail in the process. So it was quite an adjustment. Finally, on his attitudes when he first got in office. During the transition, they brought Count de Morange, Count de Morange head of the French Sûreté, to the West Coast. And he told the president-elect that he was going to be challenged militarily by the Soviets in his first year in office, and that that would probably occur in Central America. And that was why when they came to Washington, the focus on events in Central America got a great deal more prominence because they believed this was not just Castro, that it was the Soviets testing him. So uh, the cautionary note about who gets access to a president-elect and uh, talks to them during that transition period, and I better stop there. <laughs> okay. All right. Professor Now. Okay, thanks, Will. Uh, well, it's, when, when Will asked me, uh, or told me, I guess, about six months ago that he was thinking about a conference on Reagan, um, I simply said to him, how long can I stay? Um, there aren't that many such events going on, at yeah. least in the academic world. Um, certainly not our, at our annual conventions. In any case, I think um, uh, this is an extremely worthwhile uh, um, opportunity. Um, I'm, I'm also humbled to be on this panel, obviously, with these, with these distinguished gentlemen. Uh, it's probably the reason why I'm not wearing a tie. <laughs> uh, but um, let me um, just make a few comments about my impressions of Reagan. Now, I was in the White House uh, in the transition team and then in the White House from the beginning of the Reagan administration through the fall of 1983. Um, and ran a small shop. We had about five people on the international economic side of things on the NSC and dealt largely, of course, with his domestic economic policy and its implications and ramifications for the international economy. Um, the summit process at that time, which was a G7 process, was extremely important for both forcing us to think systematically about our own domestic policy and to try to explain it and project it uh, to the other allies, and then, of course, uh, an effort to try to coordinate those policies. And those summit activities didn't occur just once a year. They really occurred about six or eight times a year. We had regular meetings every couple of months and then lots of exchanges back and forth. Uh, and I was the White House Sherpa on the team, on the American team, which included the Undersecretary for Economic Affairs and the Undersecretary for Monetary Affairs in, in the Treasury Department. Um, I didn't meet Reagan until um, the early 1980s, uh, a meeting in February, in fact, when he came to Washington after I'd been asked to serve on the Foreign Policy Advisory Board. Um, and um, my first impressions were very favorable. Um, this was a meeting at the CSIS on K Street, and um, we had assembled maybe about 50 of us. Uh, and the minute Reagan walked in, I had, not, I had never met him, I had never seen him personally, but the minute he walked into the room, uh, I, I, I often wondered what was it that struck me about him. He, he, he always surveyed a room when he walked in. He, he never just kind of walked in and went to his seat. He kind of walked in, looked around, he made eye contact with people, always of course had a smile about him, but also had this stature. He had some real stature. I've thought about that a lot actually over the years in writing about him and so on. And I think one of his attributes as a leader and in this kind of a situation was his presence and concept of sort of presence. It's an actor's concept, but in his case, he just filled that room with presence. Um, and that was his, to some extent, that was part of his um, charisma. He made a comment at that meeting which also endeared him to me. 
because he uh, told us we were supposed to be thinking about the policy uh, aspects of what he would be doing if he was elected. This is February now of 1980, and he, he said, look, I've got plenty of people helping me with a campaign. I don't need you to help me with a campaign. I want you to think about what I should be doing once I get into that little White House down the street. And he said, you know what? Uh, if I don't get into that little White House down the street, he said, who needs it at my age? Now, that could have seen interpreted as a flippant comment. I took it as a comment that this wasn't about Ronald Reagan. This was about what he wanted to do. This was about the country. Uh, so this kind of selflessness, the man was extremely self-confident and yet not narcissistic in any way, very um, comfortable in his own skin, um, and genuinely, I think, there because of what he believed, the ideas that he had developed over the years. Now, this is, sounds strange when you think about Ronald Reagan because his image is one of, you know, an amiable dunce. At least that's the way he was uh, identified when he came to Washington by his critics. Um, but in fact, the man was extremely bright. I mean, there's a lot of evidence, and I would urge, especially the people who examine the record, and the, to go back and to look at his days at, uh, in college. He, he was a very bright guy who had a, voracious, had a, had a very um, good memory, um, who was interested in lots of things, uh, who actually read lots of things, in some ways unusual things. Um, and I'm trying to, one of the things I'm working on currently is to try to put together what he read, when, and then to try to look at um, uh, memoirs of people he was dealing with at that time, for example, his early Hollywood years, to see what, if they remember any of the conversations that they may have had with him. Because he was reading so much and was so interested in political questions when he was in Hollywood in the early years that Bill Holden tells a story now that was a very close friend of his uh, during those years, tells the story that when he came into the cafeteria, People would try to sit someplace where he wouldn't join them because they didn't want to have to speak and debate and talk about politics during the course of the... So the man was a good deal more um, intellectually active. And I think the record, you know, what we've now discovered in terms of all the writings that he did, uh, the speeches in the 1960s, um, the letters that he wrote... He has, so far, there's been more than 10,000 letters, 10,000 letters collected that Ronald Reagan wrote. Um, excuse me? Handwritten. I'm handwritten. Handwritten, indeed. All handwritten. Um, Jefferson only wrote 18,000 letters. And in his day, that's all, the only way you could communicate. Uh, Reagan, of course, had many other ways to communicate. Schultz once said, and I think very insightfully, he said, you know, a man who writes a lot thinks a lot. And someone who thinks a lot has probably read a lot. There were a number of occasions while Reagan was in office where his press secretary asked him if he could release the books that he was reading. Reagan refused to let him do that. He said, no, it's not necessary. Uh, and he was reading substantive books. Some of this you, you know, has been put together by people over the years. So anyway, I, I, I mention this because, and emphasize it, uh, because for those of you who are looking at the archival records and so on, be aware or at least double check any time you want to reach the conclusion that it wasn't really Reagan who was doing this, who had these ideas. It was really one of his staff people. Uh, because Reagan had a unique way of interacting with his staff. But if you look at the issues that he was concerned about, um, and in my case, the economic issues, Reagan needed every one of his staff people, key staff people, when thinking about economic policy. Right? But he didn't need anyone. He needed them all because he was the only one who sort of put together the pieces. I mean, when you think about economic policy, he had supply siders, he had monetarists, he had fiscal conservatives, he had trade, people who were concerned about trade liberalization, had all of these groups. Now, Reagan's strategy had a way of putting those things together. Uh, and that story's been told. I've told it, by the way, in a book that was published in 1990. Uh, by Oxford called The Myth of America's Decline. It's a detailed account. I was going to raise it up. and <laughs> Thank you, Will. I, you've saved me a little embarrassment here at my own self-promotion. Um, and um, th there was a strategy. The most important thing to read, I think, when you're looking at those early years and Reagan's policies, whether it's on economic policy or energy policy or any of these things, is go to the NSDDs. 
Uh, Bill Clark did an enormous job as the national security advisor for Ronald Reagan from early 1982 till the end of 1983 because he organized more than 100 national security decision uh, directives that were done during that time. Every one of those were a four, three, four month process where we brought together the agencies and we tried to organize, we tried to integrate Reagan's ideas with the details and with the responsibilities of the different agencies. And some of those now, especially the ones with respect to the Soviet Union, are, are getting some attention. But there are a lot more in there. And, and, and on the summits, I would urge you to read the memos that went to the president before those major summit meetings. There were three of them that I was involved in, um, uh, Ottawa, Versailles, and Williamsburg. Uh, and then there was a first, by the way, summit with developing countries, which was kind of a precursor of the G20. It was a conference with uh, the developing countries in Cancun in October of 1981. Uh, the Williamsburg Summit, I like to think of, sparked here by uh, Ken's wonderful book, beautifully written, by the way. You've got to read that book and his comments here today. Um, but I was struck by the, um, the uh, uh, oh, goodness, now I've lost track of my thought. But, um, Williamsburg uh, Summit. Yeah, the Williamsburg, that, that the Williamsburg Summit was, in fact, kind of the Reykjavik Summit of economic policy. Because it was the summit in which we had, we had had, of course, some very severe conflicts with the Allies at Versailles. But at Williamsburg, it was kind of where we kind of really got together. We really, you know, began to see where we were going. Uh, and from that summit, by the way, which has an annex, and that annex details the kind of policies that we were going to pursue. By the way, the French, within six months, were pursuing many of those policies. They became the basis for the, William, for the Washington Consensus which became the IMF sort of um, uh, format for economic policy in the late 80s and in the 1990s. And in some sense, that summit set out a very coherent set of economic policies that more or less spread to the other OECD countries uh, and eventually to many of the developing countries and coincided with one of the, best, one of the biggest booms. I call it the great expansion, not the great moderation <coughs> great expansion that took place between 1980 and 2010 because we had real GDP, annual GDP growth in the world during that period of 3%. This includes, by the way, the 2008-2009 uh, recession, all right, because the Chinese kept growing very, very effectively during that recession. So world growth uh, was sustained during that period. But this is an extraordinary record. It compares very favorably to the period right after World War II um, and you have to ask yourself the question, how did this happen? Now, you know, I understand we heard already this afternoon, and we'll hear again, um, I'm sure, tomorrow and the next day, uh, about all the factors that could have perhaps um, caused this. I mean, I would urge us to think hard about, you know, as Ken mentioned, uh, maybe the first question ought to be, what of, what of these outcomes did agents like Ronald Reagan or like Margaret Thatcher, did they cause? All right, try to, don't look for factors, because there are hundreds of factors out there. Don't look for factors that might account for why these things would have occurred even without those agents. But rather ask the question, what did the agents do? What did they think? How did they implement their thoughts? And here you need to trace Reagan's ideas into the policies that he put in place. And how did those policies then actually change structures, change circumstances? I mean, in the case of the information revolution, which some people regard as the reason why the economy uh, came back in the 1980s, the question is, would it have come back if we had not revitalized the economies that existed in the industrialized countries and in the developing world in the 1970s? Remember that period? That was a whole decade of stagflation. No growth, very high inflation, um, uh, increasing trade protectionism, of course, commodity prices out of control. Um, a very bad era, um, and, and somehow or other that got turned around. Well, I think you could make a case, and I try to make that case in this book, uh, that Reagan's policies had something to do with that. So tracing sort of uh, how agents think about a policy, whether or not the policies they implement are consistent with those ideas, and then whether or not they can be linked in some reasonable way with outcomes. And you can develop an explanation which doesn't just depend upon this notion that, well, things would have happened that way anyway. Um, let, 
why is it important, I suppose, let me conclude with this thought, why is it important to kind of um, pay attention to the role of, in this case, the role of Ronald Reagan, who I think had uh, some very clear ideas that he had formulated over a long period of time, put them into policies, uh, and those policies coincided with outcomes that you might have predicted on the basis of, of those policies. By the way, every time we've had periods in which we've implemented policies like Reagan did, supply side sort of incentive policies, uh, monetary uh, stability, that is efforts to try to manage inflation, some deregulation, not uh, you know massive deregulation, but some deregulation, and then trade liberalization. Every time we've had periods of policies like that, we've had extraordinary growth. I mean, under Harding, we had growth of 14% in 1922. And you look at Harry Harding, I mean, Harry Harding, you look at William Harding's policies in, uh, uh, that he put into place in 1921. He took over a very stagnant economy, by the way, from Wilson. And then we had a boom of seven or eight years uh, in the course of the 1920s. It happened again under John, John F. Kennedy, and then it happened under Reagan. Will it happen again under Trump? I mean, you know, I, I, there's a good question for us to think about and talk about. I, you know, there are many reasons why it doesn't look like it will. But nevertheless, um, to try to make that case for agency before you revert uh, to structure. And the reason for doing that is, I think, just to um, make policy accountable. Because if things happen, and agents aren't important in terms of what happens, then you really can't hold leaders accountable. Um, you then have to sort of look to fate, I suppose, or whatever those developments are that you're pointing to that leaders either adjust to and succeed or don't adjust to and, and fail. Where do those general and structural changes, where do they come from? Um, Reagan's legacy, um, a final thought about that. I'm, I wonder about it because um, I know from my own personal experience in the academic world, there are very few people in the academic world who served in the Reagan administration. By contrast, there are a lot of people in the academic world who served in the Clinton administration, some earlier in the Carter administration. There'll be many coming out now from the Obama administration, including David Axelrod, who is gonna run an institute for politics, who is in fact running an institute for politics at the University of Chicago. So they're gonna be turning out a lot of legacy stuff on Obama. It's not much of that that's being done on Reagan. And yet Reagan, I think, in two ways, was one of the most extraordinary presidents we've had in um, the history of the country. Um, and let me, just, let me just identify what those two, um, those two factors are. Uh, first of all, he is the, um, he's one of five presidents that sort of led the country through an existential crisis, an existential crisis. I mean, you have Washington, you have Lincoln, you have Wilson, you have Roosevelt, all dealing with wars, and Reagan dealing, in effect, with the preemption of a war, the preemption of the Cold War. Um, much more difficult to do, by the way, than to manage, in, in some sense, much more commendable, uh, than to manage a war after it breaks out. Reagan actually preempted a war. Uh, and secondly, he is one of eight presidents who, has, who was reelected twice and, tur which, and turned over the White House to his own party, which suggests not only that he, had, uh, he was able to sort of engineer outcomes, but he was able to bring the public along with him. Uh, he, he, re he retired, of course, with something like 68% approval rating. Now, there are only uh, Three of those other eight, by the way, were founding fathers, Jefferson, Madison, uh, and um, 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 not Washington, and Washington, sorry. Um, five of them uh, were um, um, included Lincoln, um, McKinley, um, Roosevelt, of course, and now Reagan. In the 21st century, 20th century, Reagan is the only other president beside Roosevelt that was reelected twice and turned the party over to his own, uh, uh, turned the White House over to his own party. Now, I think that says something about both of those things in terms of what he accomplished and how he was able to bring along public opinion. Say something about the 
extraordinary leadership of, 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 of this individual. Um, so I'll leave it at that and open it up for questions. Great, thanks. All right, well, let's just turn it over to the audience for questions. May, may I do ask? just oh, oh, yeah, two quick okay. things that I thought in this part? And to set in context the role of Nancy Reagan, <clears throat> an enormously close and loving relationship. She wasn't looking for power on her own. She was totally devoted to him. But most importantly, she was determined to protect his health. So the instruction, the day we began, the 21st of uh, January, 10 hours a day, the president's available. If there's an evening function, that comes out of the 10 hours. And she was unbending on that. But what it did was bring discipline. And that's the second individual, Jim Baker. And the skill with which he brought management, time management. First year, 90% of the events were domestic. By the eighth year, 90% were international in, in the process. But the, the impact of those two individuals in the, the milieu around him in which the policies and decisions were created and developed. Stop. Okay. So we're going to turn over to questions. I'll just ask that you wait until you get the microphone to ask the question, and please identify yourself, your name and your, uh, your institution. This is for our, our friends at C-SPAN. So here we go, right here in front of you. Please. Hi, good evening. Is it, okay? is it open? Good evening, and thank you so much for the terrific uh, talks. I'm here with my uh, colleague, Jordana. Uh, my name is Ori Rabinowitz. I'm from the Hebrew University. And uh, um, we co-authored a paper on uh, the Reagan administration's reactions and thoughts to the uh, Israeli strike at Osirak mm -hmm. in June 81. And there are several questions that <laughs> interest us, but I'll limit myself to one, or maybe one and a half. So how was the strike actually perceived by the president himself and by the close uh, advisors because we've seen several accounts and they seem to be clashing and there is a revisionist account which we have our own take on but we would be very very much interested in hearing your thoughts on it was it framed as a huge success uh, in favor of non-proliferation or was it framed as a um, sort of a stab in the back by, by, by an ally that didn't really consult before launching it. Do you want to add anything? <laughs> we'll, we'll stop here and uh, so other people can have their time. Thank you. We'd like to take that up. Go ahead, Andrew. Unfortunately, I couldn't hear the bulk of the about question. The, uh, can you please? Oh yeah, the, the, the question was about what did you observe about President Reagan's response to Israel's attack on the Iraqi nuclear Iraq reactor at Osirak. Was that uh, June of 81? Mm -hmm. June, June of 81. Yeah. yeah, because there's competing accounts about did, uh, was President Reagan upset about it? Uh, was he supportive of it? Um, <coughs> Surprised. Okay. Um, <coughs> the entire US government was surprised. And in looking at uh, 800 miles, out at the absolute outer limits, the aircraft to reach and do the strike and come back. That meant precision targeting information. Only Britain and Israel could automatically requisition satellite <coughs> photography. Everybody else had to ask for it. So the question asked was, um, what's Israel drawn in the last six months? Osira plus an awful lot of other potential targets as well. Um, the decision I took was to constrain the automatic requisitioning. Up to 200 miles, anything that was defending. Beyond that, for offensive purposes, they had to ask. Um, Sharon was so furious he came uh, to the U.S. try to overturn that, and it was Weinberger's strong support that kept it in place. Uh, the actual dialogue with the president about it wasn't from Casey or me, it was from Weinberger uh, in the process. Um, but it was a reaffirmation of what we already knew, that 
if Israel considered it to be uh, potentially life-threatening, they would not ask for permission, they would act. And I don't think that's fundamentally changed to the present time. Professor Edelman, anything to add on that? I was at the UN and Jean Kirkpatrick watered down a resolution so that it was almost nothing. But it wasn't almost nothing, it was still something. <laughs> and uh, it was uh, a situation where she really fought and couldn't stand voting for it because it was the most mild, almost unseeable condemnation of Israel, but it was still taken as uh, anti-Israel. And so she didn't like it one bit. Al Haig liked it a lot, and so he pushed it. Uh, I think Ronald Reagan, if I had to guess, because I don't know, uh, thought that the attack was uh, totally justified and fine. <coughs> Part of the argument was that it was a preemptive attack. The nuclear reactor, as you know very well, hadn't gone critical. Uh, why don't you just wait till it went critical? <coughs> Excuse me. And the counter argument to that was very simple. Would you be happier if it went critical? I mean, you know, then every, every uh, cold that happened to anybody in the Middle East would have been blamed on Israel for uh, putting all this radiation in the air. So I always thought that was kind of a stupid argument, to tell you the truth. But uh, I never heard Ronald Reagan uh, say a word ab against it. And uh, I, I heard Al Haig speak against it. And Jean Kirkpatrick vote against it, much to her displeasure. And Henry, I know that you weren't working on non-pro or Middle East stuff, but you were at the White House at the time. Any? Yeah, no, I don't remember anything from that uh, particular uh, incident or, or period of time. But I do remember um, Reagan's reaction at the Versailles summit to the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, uh, which occurred on the second day of that summit, I think it was. Yeah. And um, Mitterrand immediately changed the subject of the conversation. And of course, the Europeans one after the other, kind of came out strongly against what Israel was doing. And I remember the president jumping in and saying, look, I mean, we need to look at the, at the facts here. We need to see what kind of circumstances they were facing, and uh, let's don't jump to conclusions. <coughs> you know, he was very uh, protective, you could say, in that situation of, uh, of Israel. But then after a while, he turned against it. Yes, yes. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, said. Uh, Professor Leffler. Uh, oh, and, and here comes the microphone, sorry. I'd love to hear your thoughts about Ronald Reagan and the Iran-Contra issue. <laughs> <laughs> if I can add one thing on this, um, Ambassador Edelman, I didn't get to ask you this of your presentation earlier, but the timing is eerie. Uh, those of you may know that uh, Iran-Contra broke three weeks after Reykjavik, um, and so, We've got this, you know, kind of obviously in some ways very triumphant summit and the administration's riding high. You saw John Poindexter in the pictures, Don Regan, and they were both gone very quickly after that. So um, I had the same question. Thank you uh, for our cameras. as from Professor Mel Leffler of the University of Virginia. I was not there. Uh, supposition, respond. President began his morning with the senior staff uh, and rather than intelligence coming to brief, the National Security Advisor, frequent, particularly after the shift to McFarland and then Poindexter. And they'd run through items, 10, 12 items that had gone on. President, generally, were you good, good. Jim Baker would stop it to say, how, when, what happened? And the president would listen very carefully to what was spelled out. And then you had the Baker-Regan shift of jobs. And Don Regan's reaction, if the president said good, he would say great, not asking questions or challenging. So what the president lost in that change was somebody listening carefully as they're slipping pretty quickly through all the things they're doing and raise questions. And I suspect Poindexter had, and by the way, we found a solution for funding 
president would say good, and it would if Baker had still been there, there would have been a discussion then about what is it you're doing, and it would have surfaced in the process. So it's the impact of the shift of principal advisors in the process, and how they either supported him or let things drift by. I first heard of Iran Contra on the flight back from Reykjavik. And uh, <clears throat> like I said at the talk, Thursday night we came in, Friday night I didn't get much sleep, Saturday did all nighter, and then I was asked late in the afternoon on Sunday to go back on the press plane to brief them the whole way back, which was a real pain in the neck, to tell you the truth. And I'm sure I was almost incoherent. Uh, but <clears throat> one of the reporters on the plane said, can I talk to you for a minute? The other reporters had a big stink fit about it because uh, you know this was going to be individual. She promised everybody that it was just a subject that was not related to Russia or Ar Soviet Union or arms control at all. It was something totally different, so they let it go. And so I went and stood on the side of the plane, which was very noisy, by the way. And um, she said, I heard these reports about exchanging arms for hostages in the Middle East, and came out of Lebanon newspaper, and went on. And I said, A, I know nothing about it, so don't take my word for anything. B, it sounds crazy, it sounds kooky. And so, uh, but you know, sorry, can't help you. And that is not my bailiwick. Uh, I continued to think it was kind of crazy and uh, didn't make any sense. I've always thought about Bill Casey and how he could allow something like that. He, he was the case officer. I know. For all I know. And, and it didn't make any real sense to me. No. To put Ronald Reagan in the picture, he had a soft side to him. And it was uh, that. Poindexter would take relatives of the hostages into the Oval Office, which is a terrible, terrible, nice thing to do, but a terrible for a leader to do, because then you see him and you feel, oh my God, I should be doing something with these poor parents and these poor, you know, people are being held hostage. What can I do? And this, then you roll in with Poindexter and McFarland coming up with these schemes of what they can do. They're moderates in Iran, and you have to trade all that. And um, it just led to very bad things. Uh, I think that it would not have happened had Reagan been otherwise advised. I think it would not have happened if Reagan had the whole story. I, I think agree. Don Regan was uh, derelict in his job, and Poindexter was manipulative in his job. And Bud McFarlane was looking for a way to be the Henry Kissinger of the Middle East yeah. and a breakthrough, a breakthrough uh, with Iran on it. And as you said, Will, uh, I was in the arms control business, good friends with Frank Carlucci, who at Thanksgiving called me up right when we get back from going to my brother's Thanksgiving in North Carolina and said the president's going to ask me to be national security advisor um, tomorrow. This was a Monday after Thanksgiving. Would you lead my transition group? It was absolutely the worst job I ever had in my life uh, because Cleaning what you house. did was you found out that the national security whole group in NSC staff, which then was about 120, now it's ballooned up a lot 600. more, uh, about 120, uh, a lot of them had been there for six years. And so, you know, it's time for some new blood. Uh, a lot of them were responsible for all kinds of operations that the job is not for, for the operations. So right after Thanksgiving for the next uh, month, basically what I did was guillotine work, and it was awful. Uh, I had an office in the EOB. I remember calling in person after person saying, after six years you've had been here enough, and why don't you either find a job in another agency or find a job outside of government. Uh, in essence, firing them. One afternoon was a particularly heavy meeting schedule where, <clears throat> by very bad timing, a choir had come into the old EOB to sing Christmas carols. So uh, there I am in the office, uh, busily firing people where 
you know, <laughs> Christmas carols are being sung, Oh, Come All Ye Faithful, uh, outside of my door, which was absolutely horrendous. But anyway, <laughs> Frank Carlucci didn't take the job till early January because of uh, various things. So I was supposed to leave the office real good uh, when he got there. So it really was a terrible, terrible position. Uh, I did it and I uh, think it was the right thing to do, but uh, it was the right thing to do for someone else to do besides myself, to tell you the truth in retrospect. But uh, the overall answer to the question is, I think it was a real dark spot on the Reagan administration, nothing to be proud of. I think the president was certainly ultimately responsible, as he said time and time again, but it came out of this idea of, oh my gosh, I have to do something for these people who are right in front of him. Okay, and then we've got a question back here. In the back. Uh, hold on a second. For the, the mic is expeditiously moving your way. Again, please identify yourself for the camera. Uh, thanks for giving us uh, this amazing talk. My name is Brian Gibson. Uh, I study U.S.-Iraq relations, and I know that all these questions seem to be focusing on Iraq and Iran, <laughs> but I have another one that is along those lines. Um, so starting in 1983, the Iraqis started using chemical weapons against Iran. Uh, they used it all the way through the war uh, until the very end. And I'm really curious about, um, especially uh, Ambassador Edelman, I I'm really curious about how that affected your, your job um, dealing with arms control, because of course chemical weapons falls under that purview. So how, how did it really affect you? How did it, it affect President Reagan? What were his thoughts? Was it ever brought to his attention? Thanks. Uh, yes, it affected everything, uh, but not in the way I wanted it to be affected, to tell you the truth. Uh, there was clear evidence from the intelligence community that this was taking place. Saddam Hussein was fighting with Khomeini on the war. Uh, Khomeini had started it, basically. Uh, although that's in dispute. Uh, and the fact is that almost anything was better than Khomeini at that point because of the hostages, exactly. because of his yeah. uh, total hostility. Uh, Saddam Hussein was seen as a monster, but he was in some respects uh, cooperative to the United States in various realms. Okay? I, as the director of arms control, wanted to sanction at least our relationship with Iraq uh, because of the chemical weapons. We were then promoting a ban on chemical weapons, production as well as use. There had always been a use ban since World War I, I think. Uh, <clears throat> but this was on production, something that did happen years after I left the office, but we started that in 1983. George Herbert Walker Bush, Vice President of the United States, went to Geneva to introduce our ideas on banning the production of chemical weapons. So I thought that it was just totally hypocritical to have a proposing a ban on the production of nuclear weapons that had been, like I say, banned from use for 50 years uh, and agreeing, not agreeing, but going along with Iraq um, on the use of chemical weapons. I had argued about that with the State Department. I personally argued with George Schultz about the issue. And Schultz told me, A, nothing's worse than Khomeini. Uh, Saddam Hussein is a terrible person, but he's been cooperative with us in various ways, and so uh, we're not gonna abruptly change our policy because it was really a choice at that time between Iran and Iraq. I mean, there had been war, you probably know a lot more about it than, well, you certainly know a lot more about it than I do. Probably a million people died in the war, something like that. 360,000, or the casualties were killed. Yeah, much higher, maybe a million or a little short of a million, something like that. So the idea was that you had to choose one or the other. Uh, you just couldn't stand <laughs> and stand back and just let it happen. So I was very much for sanctioning or doing something uh, against Iraq and found no support in the government at all. And I remember there was even a meeting about uh, 
Iran-Iraq or a meeting about the Middle East where I made my case, uh, there was a narrow case. And I understand that. I wasn't Secretary of State. I was just arms control director looking at the use of bad uh, weapons. And so when Schultz, who did not appreciate my views, uh, <laughs> and understandably so, uh, contradicted what I said and was quite mad about it, um, I understand his point of view as well. He was looking at a way over, uh, you know, larger perspective than I was involved with. But I still think it was the right thing to do at the time. In retrospect, I still think it was the right thing to do, to have a stand like that, that this is unacceptable behavior. All right. Yes, John. Uh, thank you. Hi, I'm Jonathan Hunt at the University of Southampton. And uh, another question for you, uh, <laughs> Ambassador Edelman, if you don't mind. And this is somewhat uh, at risk to my own presentation on Saturday, which is about the follow-up to Reykjavik. And I was curious if you could characterize the kind of interagency, intergovernmental squabbles uh, that Reykjavik uh, set in motion. Uh, looking at uh, the documents in the Ronald Reagan uh, Presidential Library, uh, one of my favorite is the um, informational to the various agency heads about uh, NSDD 250, which looks to institute post-Reykjavik arms control measures. And they actually send it out on a Friday afternoon with instructions to return it. Um, uh, if I can actually read from the document, um, uh, to return it uh, by the subsequent Monday. So only giving them the weekend uh, to respond in order to try to tamp down um, on the dissension within uh, the government. So I'm curious if you could, you could speak to how Reykjavik was perceived and acted and also uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the, the administration and also try to hazard a, a guess as to why by the end of the Reagan administration you still don't have a START treaty. And it would mm. actually require another five years, another president, and the looming collapse of the Soviet Union to actually push through what was really there and outlined by the end of the Reykjavik uh, meeting. Good. Well, thank you for, for your questions. And thank you especially for the using the word squabble uh, <laughs> in the administration, because it really wasn't a squabble. It was an outright war, <laughs> and uh, a bloody war at that. And all of it was very heartfelt. All of it was very passionate. All of it was argued in front of the president at great length, and none of it mattered. Okay? It was one of those great eruptions that didn't matter at all. Why didn't it matter? A, the Joint Chiefs, Bill Crow was chairman of the Joint Chiefs at the time, uh, was absolutely furious that the head of the Soviet military, Akramayov, chief of staff of the military, that was, he was a wonderful, wonderful man at Reykjavik, spent his whole life in the army in the Soviet Union, and committed suicide when the Soviet Union fell. Collapse. Uh, in his office, on his desk, hanging himself from the chandelier, a chandelier he proudly showed me the year before in his office. But Bill Crow was absolutely furious. He was not there, and Akramayev was there. He called me the morning I got back from Reykjavik, uh, asking me what had happened and everything like that. His argument was to do away with, first of all, nuclear weapons, when there was a conventional imbalance in Europe was a very dangerous thing. Same as Maggie Thatcher's argument, that when she rolled into uh, Camp David shortly thereafter, and uh, Prime Minister Thatcher, what we'd call handbag the president, but not directly. That means, you know, just beat him over the head. But she went after the staff more and was nice uh, to Reagan. So there was the no nuclear weapons, eliminate all nuclear weapons that Reagan and Gorbachev had talked about on Sunday afternoon for a very brief amount of time, had enormous controversy. There was more substantive to do away with ballistic missiles that had been proposed at the lunch on Sunday, uh, the break before that. Uh, and that's what Bill Crow and myself at the National Security Council meeting afterwards said that was really fundamentally against American interests for various reasons of budgetary reasons and uh, uh, protection reasons that the whole triad had been built on the basis uh, 
at least two legs of the triad, the submarines and uh, land-based missiles on the basis of ballistic missiles. Uh, none of it ever mattered. I'll tell you why. Because the zero nuclear weapons was going nowhere. Uh, the ballistic missile proposal lasted about 10 minutes at Reykjavik. We went back to what we had done on Saturday night, which was the various limits and sublimits on strategic arms, and the Sunday morning on the Euro missiles. First zero in Europe, then zero in Europe and Asia, following three months later on that. Your last question on why wasn't there a START agreement. Uh, I left the administration in two days after Gorbachev left in December uh, 8th or 9th of uh, 1987. I left uh, because I was absolutely sure there would not be a START agreement. Why was there no START agreement? START agreement, which is the strategic arms as opposed to the Euro missiles, strategic arms is far more complicated. Lots more systems, lots more categories to do. Uh, we had made enormous progress at Reykjavik, but this is 1987. And so you just had 1988, 1986, you had just had 1987 and part of 88 to do that. There was no way looking at all the issues that was in the START agreement that you could ever get it done. And so it took, I think, two years into the Bush administration to uh, wrap it up. But they were wrapped up on the basis of what we had done on the Saturday night of Reykjavik. So those limits and those sublimits and those categories and the subcategories, blah, 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 that, uh, you know, I've thought since that time, 30 years now, I have thousands, thousands of parts of my brain filled with these weapon systems that has no use to anybody, <laughs> especially to me all that time. On the uh, SS-17, the SS-19, the circular air probable and all that stuff. But that's what you need to get an arms control agreement. So that's why it was, there was no way, no matter what happened, that we were going to get a strategic arms control. So in answer to your question, there was enormous eruptions in the government, very bad will that was uh, coming. It was coming right on the heels of Iran-Contra, almost at the same time. So the place was looked like it was absolutely splitting apart because you had the aftermath of the Reykjavik, but far more the aftermath or the oncoming of Iran-Contra that was uh, really questioning whether the President Reagan would make it through on these twin crises, Reykjavik a lot less than the crisis of the Iran-Contra. All kinds of arguments, but the arguments just faded. And we went back to what we had done on Saturday night and uh, it was a glorious conclusion because Reagan could do the Euro missile and leave to his predecessor the outlines, and they were the enduring outlines of uh, the strategic arms limitation talks. And it was not just Bush that did it, but after George Herbert Walker Bush, Clinton had another arms control reductions based on those sublimits and those categories. And then George W. Bush did the same thing. And lastly, Obama did. So in every administration, we've taken the basic, basic structure of the Hofty House agreements and had agreements uh, on the strategic realm. A wonderful legacy. Wonderful. And verification, the ability to verify, is a pretty heated topic <laughs> in Washington through a lot of this, particularly John Glenn yes. and others. Okay, a number of hands I'm seeing that right here. Yeah, Jennifer, there you go. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Matthias Häusler from the University of Cambridge. I have a very general question about transatlantic relations. How was Reagan's general attitude towards Europe and Western Europe in particular? Because on one hand, you have all these tensions, particularly the first term, the Versailles summit, the pipeline, um, Star Wars, you name it. On the other hand, you have Thatcher, so did he regard them as kind of helpful or more annoying? <laughs> <laughs> Henry, why don't you take us on up first? Yeah, I mean, on, um, on the economic side, um, and I think in the context of at least the um, INF question to the extent they dealt with it at the summits, by the way, that was one of the new elements of the uh, summit process at Williamsburg where they actually issued a uh, communique on the deployment of the INF weapons. Um, 
I mean, on, on that subject, Reagan was rock solid behind the alliance. I mean, uh, that was pretty clear from the very beginning. He understood that he had to first revive America's self-confidence and, of course, the American economy, um, and do his part in terms of the military buildup, but, but then he clearly was. Now, he also was not unhappy um, in, in, in sort of bucking up the the Allies, and, and, and I think the pipeline issue, which I was involved in peripherally, we had some people who were dealing with the East-West economics, and I was dealing mostly with the Western world e economics, but um, part of his interest, part of Reagan's interest, he made it very clear in NSC meetings, was to try to make the Allies understand, and to make the U.S. Congress understand, that he was serious about his defense program, and he was serious about the INF deployments. And he could not sort of understand how cooperating with the Soviets in, in you know, uh, in, in the production and export of gas uh, would somehow or other make the European population and the U.S. Congress more willing to support uh, a significant defense buildup and a significant deployment, all of which he felt was going to be necessary if you're ever going to get any serious arms control negotiations, all right, with the Soviet Union. He was very clear, by the way, and I think Ken can... Um, uh, uh, confirmed this, he was clear from the very beginning, he talked about it during the campaign in muffled terms, that he was building up the defense pending negotiations, that he was doing all of this in order to increase, not to defeat the Soviet Union in some kind of a, you know, all-out arms race, but to create leverage, um, which would convince them that they couldn't win any kind of a contest outside of the negotiations, and therefore they would get serious in the negotiations. Uh, by the way, it's a strategy he laid out very early. He talked about this in 1963. It's another thing I would sort of encourage historians to do. Don't just look at what's happening, you know, in a president's administration. In 1963, he, 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 he said the following, uh, um, and then he repeated it, by the way, almost word for word in uh, his meetings with the emissaries from the Pope in December of 1981, before he went then to Europe after the Versailles summit, uh, to visit with the Pope. Uh, and it's extraordinary. This is what I mean, too, about strategy and the fact that strategy can have an impact on events if it is, a, if it is uh, um, you know, carried out in, uh, with real conviction. He said this in 1963. Now, bear in mind, 1963, he's not even governor of California. He says, the only sure way to avoid war is surrender without fighting. But that way is based on, on wish, wishing, not thinking. And if the wish doesn't come true, the enemy is far stronger than he was before you started down that road. The other way is based on the belief, supported so far by all the evidence he added, that in an all-out race, not just arms race, but an all-out race, he meant military and economic, our system is stronger, and eventually the enemy gives up the race as a hopeless cause, then a noble nation believing in peace extends the hands of friendship and says there room, there's room in the world for both of us. Now he tells the Pope's emissaries in December 81 exactly the same thing. He says there's no miracle weapon available with which to deal with the Soviets, but we could threaten the Soviets with our ability to outbuild them, which the Soviets know we can do if we choose. Once we've established this, we would then invite the Soviets to join us in lowering the levels of weapons on both sides and joining us in the global economy. My goodness, it's, 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 I think that's extraordinary. That's an 18-year period. And this man has some very clear formulated ideas that he is um, uh, implementing. I, I think one of the big puzzles for me, and uh, it relates to what Ken has been talking about with STI, is why Reagan was, he was always clear in where he was going and what he was saying and what his goals were, but he wasn't always clear in his instructions. I think you make that point in your book uh, <laughs> to his subordinates. So, one of the things I've always wondered is why didn't he ask, in the case of SDI, for example, why didn't he ask his staff or tell his staff, look, let's get some commissions going on this. If we're going to shift from mutual assured destruction to mutual assured protection, which was his idea that somehow or other you would build down the offensive weapons, but you would build up defensive weapons, all right, and you would, be, you would then deter by mutual assured protection. Um, but that, that was such an extraordinary idea. It needed all kinds of work in the arms control community. Reagan never asked for any of that, as far as I know. He was aware, by the way, I, I have comments from him in National Security Council meetings. He was aware of the fact that this was going to create a problem on the conventional side.
But he talked about tactical nuclear weapons. He said, well, don't we have tactical nuclear weapons for that purpose? So he was wrestling you know, himself with kind of, what are the implications of all this? I always wondered, why in the hell didn't one of his staff or somebody pick up that and say, you know what, we better get Congress going on this. We better get a presidential commission going on this. Why don't we think this thing through? By the way, I don't think we've done it to this present day. We're still going after no nukes with no sense of, now, how, how are you going to deter in a world of no nukes? Uh, so it was a real odd thing about Reagan. Reagan kind of, um, I think he sort of both had clear ideas, believed you had to kind of move circumstances in line with those ideas, but then he sort of had this optimistic sense that it's all going to turn out all right if we just, you know, stay the course. And I could tell a story in a minute, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop at this point about staying the course. But again, he, large uh, successes, large movement appealed to him. And Ed Teller had gotten through Jay Keyworth to him this whole concept of mm -hmm. SDI. Mm -hmm. And it was the image of it mm -hmm. that attracted him. Yeah. Uh, there were a lot of people early on saying it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. He wasn't interested mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. It was the image of it. Mm -hmm. And the key point here, yeah, the Soviets believed it would work. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> so, and they've been doing some research on it, so that's why I'm wondering why some staff member didn't say, look, let me assume it will work. Now, what do we need to do in order to think yeah. through the strategy that would be related to it? Yeah. it? It's been said that the only two people who believed SDI could work were Reagan and Gorbachev. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one that's else right. in their government said, yeah. All right. Uh, Admiral Inman or Ambassador Edelman, anything more on uh, transatlantic relations, especially in the first term? Uh, Mrs. Thatcher was the key. And uh, much as Mrs. Merkel has been in the last five, six years, the dominant figure on the U.S. side in dealing with Europe largely in the process. Uh, and that continued on into the George H.W. Bush time as well. Uh, the other players sort of came in and out, and there were occasional conversations uh, with Mrs. Thatcher getting her assessment of the competence of the other leaders in the president. So she had a pretty dominant role in influencing how he thought about Europe, European leaders. That said, there, there were a surprising number of disputes yeah. between them uh, on the Falklands War, on uh, Grenada, on Reykjavik. I mean, all these things kept popping up, and then they wanted rights for British Airways at Dulles, and all these things <laughs> came up. Uh, one of the wonderful episodes from the Reagan years, to me, which says a lot about Reagan's character happened with Maggie Thatcher, and it was after the um, Grenada invasion. And I had a dinner <coughs> for senators and the various members of the uh, House of Commons group dealing with foreign affairs was over one night, and a fellow from that, I think the chairman of the committee, uh, had had just a few minutes with Reagan to try to get him to understand the British position on uh, <coughs> Grenada that had already happened. The uh, military operation had already happened a few weeks before. He basically got nowhere. And Thatcher got even madder and madder and madder. And so what happened was she put in a call time to talk to Ronald Reagan. And Mike Deaver was <coughs> on one end of the call and she had her personal assistant, um, Powell, on her end, and everybody knew that there was one person on the call as uh, the heads of government were talking to each other. And Thatcher started out, you know, this was a horrendous uh, breach in our trust. And Reagan being Reagan says, oh, okay, yep. And she <laughs> says, you know, <coughs> our countries are the closest. We have the special relationship. Reagan said, oh, yeah, that's right. And she says, you and I are absolutely agree as conservatives. And Reagan says, yeah, we do, Maggie, thanks. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you and I really went through so much together. Yeah, we did. And so she's getting absolutely nowhere. <laughs> and 
Consequently, being Thatcher and being very sensitive <laughs> and getting nowhere with this guy, uh, she gets madder and madder. Mike Deaver, who's across the Oval Office, sitting on the white couch there with the phone right there. Reagan's behind the desk, and she's just really handbagging him long distance, uh, just, you know, going on. And finally, Deaver is going to interrupt, really break protocol, and say, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you're talking to the President of the United States. And he's just about to do it, and his face is all red, and he's getting shaking, and all of a sudden he hears a psst, psst. And he looks over, and behind the desk is Robert Ray. Mike, Mike. He's holding up the phone receiver. Mike. And Deaver says, what is it, Mr. President? He says, Mike. And then Reagan turns up the phone while Thatcher's still screaming away. And he says, Mike, isn't she marvelous? <laughs> 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 he just couldn't be mad at anybody. <laughs> and Deaver just started laughing and held up the phone. Didn't interrupt her. And, uh, you know, eventually, probably five minutes later, <laughs> she abandoned the cause and said goodbye and probably hang up the phone. But he said, she's just wonderful. <laughs> so, so there was a great affection there. There was uh, for Cole as well, although it was yes. not on the same way. Uh, Mitterrand was a very interesting character. Mm -hmm. He was a socialist, he, you know, uh, <laughs> far left where Reagan was far right. And he adopted Reaganomics, as uh, Henry will tell you, in a way that uh, probably beyond certainly what the Germans did and beyond really much anybody but the British on that. So he, he liked the individual uh, leaders. The only leader he I ever saw, and Henry, you probably know this more than I do, uh, that he really didn't like was Pierre Trudeau of uh, Canada. And uh, Trudeau would go at him and especially at Williamsburg and maybe before. And, <laughs> and Ronald Reagan would show his total disdain, which is as uh, bad as it got when he was sitting there <coughs> kind of looking at things. And what bad as it got is he'd take off his glasses and put it down. And then he says, well, Pierre. And it was kind of like using the word Pierre it was a class difference between Ron and Pierre, you know. <laughs> and uh, so... He would, uh, because uh, <laughs> Trudeau would start to say, you know, you're the first president since uh, Grover Cleveland or somebody, uh, not to have a summit with the Soviet leader. And he would put his glasses down and say, well, Pierre, uh, they keep dying on me. What do you yeah. want? And they did. <laughs> and they did yeah. keep dying on me. So uh, he, he was the only one that really got Reagan's uh, back up. But uh, Reagan had a wonderful, and it's good to mention today on the eve of the inauguration tomorrow, he had a wonderful ability to um, shrug off opposition, not pay attention to opposition, uh, give everybody the benefit of the doubt. There was a wonderful time in 1984 where he's going through, I think it's Detroit or some city like that, and um, <coughs> a guy... The motorcade is going very slow because they're approaching something. A guy right near the motorcade has a sign, impeach Reagan, and he's screaming, Reagan's policies are a disaster. We should impeach Reagan. He's the worst leader we've had in the American history. And, you know, just screaming his head off. Reagan's sitting in the car, hears all this. He turns uh, to the person sitting next to him, Frank Ferenkoff, and he says, uh, Frank, see that guy out there? And he says, yeah. He says, put him down as undecided. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably, lean, probably leaning against, uh, but undecided as of now. <laughs> and, you know, just burst out laughing. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful trait. Uh, and it's wonderful to remember, especially right now, that um, I think it's a great trait of leadership. And as we go into all of this, his respect for the office of yeah. the presidency. Mm -hmm. And the incident that comes back to me, they'd been out in the Rose Garden, hot, sticky afternoon. He and Deaver come back into the Oval Office. Mike's taking off his jacket and said, Mr. President, take off your jacket. And his response was, Mike, I could never take off my jacket in this office. 
in the process. He said, he, that was on January 20th, too. He said, this is sacred territory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just looked down. Uh, Henry, did you have a... Well, you may not. I was just going to mm, tell a little story about staying the course. I mean, because the other thing at Reagan, although he was very um, courteous and, uh, I, you know, maybe once I saw him a little heated, um, and had all of these ways of kind of just letting things, uh, you know, go by. He was also at times very, very stubborn. Mm -hmm. And those times proved to be very important. Uh, and I recall very vividly a meeting, you know, there's this argument that Reagan reversed himself in 1983 when, you know, the Korean airliner and the Lebanese, the, the Marines in Lebanon and um, all of these events occurred in 1983. Uh, that told him that, hey, wait a minute, I'm an able archer, you know, this exercise that presumably the Soviets thought we were about to uh, uh, attack them under the, uh, under the guise of this able archer exercise. Uh, and so there is a theory out there that Reagan at this moment came, realized his policies might cause World War III and he shifted. Well, the fact is, if he was going to shift, things were, the time he would have shifted would have been 1982, the fall of 1982, where absolutely nothing was going right. The economy was still completely in the doldrums. Of course, the arms control negotiations were going nowhere. The walk in the woods proposal had been disposed of. Um, he lost, by the way, I think uh, 26 seats in the uh, elections in 1982. So if you want to look at a time when it was really bleak, and my boss, Bill Clark, um, I'll just say parenthetic parenthetically, don't exclude him when you do the archival work. Yeah. Look mm -hmm. at Clark's work. Clark did an incredible job. It doesn't get much credit for it. Anyway, Clark took a couple of us into the Oval Office with the president to talk about, well, first, I was to tell him about what happened at the GATT ministerial meeting, which occurred. We actually tried to launch a trade round, can you imagine, in the middle of the worst recession the world had seen uh, since World War II. We didn't get anywhere, and so I was supposed to tell the president about that. A couple other people were reporting on the Soviet um, uh, the situation with the Soviet Union. And so at the end of it, Bill Clark looked at the president and said, Mr. President, should we be thinking about a plan B? And, uh, you know, Reagan sort of sat there uh, seemingly unaffected and kind of looked up at the ceiling for a moment. He said, no, he said, I don't think so, Bill. He said, I don't think so. I think the uh, Soviet Union, I said, my, my economic plans are in place. And he said, we'll see if they work or not. Remember, nothing, it, it wasn't until the spring, the late spring of 1983, that the economic uh, situation began to improve. So he says, no, I think that economic plan. And he said, you know, I don't think the Soviets are going to come. I think they're going to come around. Let's just give it time. And um, then he looked at Clark, and he kind of rocked back in his chair, and he said, Bill, what's the worst thing that can happen to you and me if it doesn't happen, that is, if none of this happens? And he said, you know, you and I go back to the ranch. What could be so bad about that? I mean, the guy had a commitment to his policies in the worst time, I think, of his entire presidency, maybe Iran-Contra's uh, it comes pretty close, but look, nothing was working in the fall of 82, and yet he decided, nope, I'm here for this purpose, I've got these ideas, I've put them in place, I'm going to hang in there, and if it doesn't work, I'll be happy to go back to the ranch. I mean, it wasn't about Ronald Reagan. All right, well, uh, we are past our time, so please join me in thanking this very singular panel. <laughs> so, And uh, to see maybe the time's right uh, for the uh, the public conference. We resume in this room tomorrow morning.